All right, the, the next talk is by Dr. Ed Wallen, the role of chemotherapy in well-differentiated nets. And uh, this is really important. This is, I think, one of the emerging areas where new things are gonna happen in the next 10 years. Dr. Ed Wallen, uh, now in New York City, for 26 or 27 years, was the director of the Neuroendocrine Tumor Project at Cedar Sinai in Los Angeles, now recently moved uh, to New York. Ed. Thank you. Well, welcome everybody. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here and to speak with you and to uh, share some new information with all of the patients and caregivers and colleagues and friends. Um, welcome. I'm going to be talking about the status of chemotherapy in the treatment of NET, with chemotherapy being uh, loosely defined as chemotherapy, biologic therapy, immune therapy, and other types of systemic therapy, in addition to some of the other therapies you've heard about. First of all, chemotherapy for neuroendocrine tumors does not usually result in a major reduction in tumor size, although often there's a modest uh, decrease in the size of the tumor. It's what we call a low response rate. However, despite this low response rate, time to progression can be markedly prolonged, potentially extending survival and increasing the quality of life. This is actually the same type of goal that we have from PRRT and from using somatostatin analogs like lanreotide or octreotide. It's progression-free survival prolongation that's making the biggest difference. The next big leap forward will be making the tumors go away when they're already metastatic. Right now, the only curative treatment that can really make them go away in a reliable way is surgery. High-grade or poorly differentiated neuroendocrine tumors often respond to chemotherapy much better and result in major shrinkage of cancer. I'm giving you some basic principles before we start talking about all the details. Pancreatic neuroendocrine cancers respond better to chemotherapy than other types of neuroendocrine cancer. And whether it's chemotherapy or biologic therapy, pancreatic cancers usually respond the best. Just to give you a little idea of the current landscape, there are a few drugs in the United States which are approved for treating neuroendocrine tumors. Lanreotide is approved and Everolimus for carcinoid tumors. And for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, we have lanreotide, everolimus, sunitinib, and streptozosin. That means all other treatments that we are discussing and will discuss for neuroendocrine tumors are either unapproved or still investigational in this country, although there are other things that we know have effectiveness. Chemotherapy with traditional drugs like platinum and etoposide is highly effective in really high-grade neuroendocrine tumors and is actually approved for that use, has lower effectiveness in other types of neuroendocrine tumors. What we know about treating neuroendocrine tumor with chemotherapy has happened just over the last couple of years. Since 2011, we now have five out of the existing seven drugs that have ever been approved in the United States, with each of these approvals based on a major randomized phase three clinical trial that definitively proved the value of these treatments. The first treatment was with streptozosin for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, that was back in the 1980s. Octreotide LAR was shown to be effective in treating neuroendocrine cancers of the gut in the PROMID trial. However, that was never approved for that use in the United States. It's approved only for treating carcinoid syndrome, treating the flushing and diarrhea. Subsequently, we have the landmark Radian 3 trial, proving the effectiveness of Everolimus in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, and later Radian 4, proving the effectiveness of Everolimus in lung and gut carcinoid. We'll be talking about these trials in detail. Sunitinib, uh, proven to be effective in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. And I'm not going to be speaking in this talk about somatostatin analogs, since Eric Liu is going to be covering that subject in the next talk but it's certainly something uh, very, um, that I'm very much involved with, having done a lot of the studies with lanreotide leading, leading to its approval in the clarinet trial and the elect trial. And uh, I'm involved also in the lanreotide trial for lung carcinoid tumors, which is ongoing. 
you'll be hearing more about some of these when Dr. Liu speaks. Also, I've been highly involved in peptide receptor radiotherapy, PRRT, in the NETR1 trial, and have a trial that's active right now in the expanded access program of giving lutetium-177 dotatate, but that's also a subject I'm not going to be speaking about in detail in this talk since those have been addressed in other presentations. Targeted biologic therapy for neuroendocrine tumor is starting to come of age. There are unique chemicals in neuroendocrine cells and on their membranes that make them ideal for targeted therapy. They have increased blood vessels and substances that stimulate blood vessel growth, which is necessary for the life of neuroendocrine cells. Their cell membranes have increased tyrosine kinase receptors that allow them to respond to various types of pills called tyrosine kinase inhibitors. There are genes involved in maintaining the malignant state that are overactive in neuroendocrine tumors and that can be targeted. They have lost dependence on external stimuli to proliferate and instead generate internal signals and just keep growing uncontrollably and we now could address those types of signals. They are not responding to stop growing signals. They metastasize more easily because they don't stick to the matrix and we're working on ways of dealing with the tumor matrix. And the, again, the landscape is changing rapidly. There are defects in enzymes that are necessary for apoptosis to occur. That's the targeted normal cell death that occurs in cells that aren't needed so that cells will just keep growing when they're not needed anymore. That happens in tumors to make them grow into masses. And for m many sorts of reasons like this, these tumors are very susceptible to types of biologic therapy. In addition, there's a concept of personalizing care based on the genetic background of a tumor. We can actually analyze the genes, the genome of the tumor, and based on the individual genes in the tumor, the molecular profiling can come up with a custom therapy that might be appropriate for that type of malignancy. This approach was studied by several people, including Dr. Warner, who's here today. Potentially beneficial therapies were identified based on measuring expression of 20 proteins and oncogenes and also on a comprehensive review of the chemotherapy response literature. Clinical charts of 41 patients were reviewed retrospectively and 12 were selected as representatives of the range of effects molecular profiling has on cancer treatment. Nine patients were treated with drugs that were identified as potentially beneficial by molecular profiling, including capecitabine, fifluorouracil, temozolomide, oxaliplatin, and gemcitabine. And in many of these cases, these were drugs that in the particular circumstances would not have been chosen as the next therapy. Clinical symptoms, serum markers of disease, and radiologic evidence of response were identified in five out of nine patients. Two additional ones had mixed responses where some tumors were bigger and some were smaller, and there were only two that didn't respond at all to treatment. This is a, obviously an early exploratory study, but would certainly lay the groundwork, I think, for larger, uh, large-scale randomized trials and other types of studies to clearly identify where molecular profiling will fall in the management of cancer. As you've heard earlier today, in some types of cancer, molecular profiling has become standard. It's not yet standard in neuroendocrine cancer, and it is hoped that in the future this will play an important role. There are, however, problems with new technologies, including molecular profiling, where sometimes the technology is so good that it exceeds our ability to use and interpret it properly. Some of the assays have not yet been um, validated. Sometimes incorrect patients are selected for treatment based on these assays because you might think that there's a mutation that would lead to response and there can be another mutation that hasn't been appreciated that can lead to um, resistance to the medication. It can increase the cost of care. There's a problem screening many, many patients for uncommon events that can lead to um, a lot of extra expense and, and time. 
targets change as mutations happen over time. And just like we heard that the KI-67 in a tumor can increase over time and the proliferation rate can change, you can also develop additional mutations and additional resistance to chemotherapy or even susceptibility to other types of chemotherapy over time. And new methods have to be developed to have current biopsy material for analysis. It's not so convenient in neuroendocrine cancers to obtain fresh specimens for analysis since tumors are usually internal. And the hope is that circulating tumor cells, circulating DNA, other types of things that can be found in the blood may turn out to be useful in the future. And most importantly, we don't have enough medicines yet to treat all the defects that can be found in different genes. But as time goes on and the treatment arsenal improves, I think it will become more and more useful. But just keep this in mind. Um, and we'll then move on and talk a little bit about some basic principles of immunotherapy. Immunotherapy involves the use of drugs that stimulate the patient's immune system to attack cancer cells or can involve the use of infused antibodies that attack cancer cells. Specialized white blood cells in the immune system, called T cells, can be stimulated in several ways by drugs that allow them to recognize and kill cancer cells. The one that is getting the most press right now and the most clinical trials is one called immune checkpoint inhibitors. As you can see on this little picture, there is a molecule on the tumor cell called PDL1, which interacts with something on a T cell called PD1. That when PD1 and PDL1 are touching each other and relating, it turns off the T cell so the T cell cannot attack the cancer. So the cancer cell can be right there kissing the T cell and the T cell is not doing anything about it, even though the T cell, if it's activated, has the potential of destroying the cancer. The T cell receptor has interacted with the T cell antigen, the T cell receptor has inter um, interacted with the antigen on the tumor cell that lets it know it is a tumor cell, but it's not killing it. So the picture on your left side is what happens when a cancer is growing in a person's body and preventing the immune system from attacking it. After all, if the immune system were able to attack it, the cancer would be dead and you wouldn't have a tumor. It's only because the immune system can't destroy it that the tumor is growing in the first place. So this is the natural situation. So if we interrupt this by breaking that uh, connection between PD-1 and PDL one the T cell turns on, becomes nasty, and destroys the cancer cell, and you end up with a dead cancer cell. So this is the concept of immune checkpoint inhibitor, a very, very important concept. And you can see that attacking the PD-1 molecule or attacking PDL1, either way, can accomplish the same goal of preventing that interaction, destroying the um, breaks, and letting the T cell get turned on and kill the cancer. Okay? So, Immune therapy with these immune checkpoint inhibitors, just to review, allows the naturally occurring T cells near the tumor to attack the tumor cells. These can be drugs in the immune checkpoints called CTLA4, PD1, PDL1. Most of the drugs fall into those categories. In high grade neuroendocrine tumors, the effects have been dramatic. Okay? There are two studies that were both reported at the American Society of Oncology this year, one called Keno 206 of pembrolizumab. 35% of patients had a major response rate, huge reduction in tumor on x-ray compared to um, what was happening before, which was resistance to chemotherapy and uncontrolled cancer growth. It was remarkable. Another trial called Checkmate 032, nivolumab, which is another immune checkpoint inhibitor, was used alone or in combination with the CTLA-4 inhibitor called ipilimumab. So this is a combination of two immune checkpoint inhibitors. And when you put the two together, 54% had a major tumor uh, death as compared to 38% with nivolumab, but also at the expense of increased toxicity. 
So uh, which is going to turn out to be better in clinical practice, we don't know. And we don't know in well-differentiated cancer exactly what the role of these drugs is going to be. So to answer this question, we have trials of immune checkpoint inhibitor medications in the well-differentiated grade one and grade two neuroendocrine tumors, carcinoids, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, that are now being set up and will be active and available uh, within months. Next type of therapy is called immunotherapy using adoptive cell transfer. These are things you might have read about or heard about. Using T cells which are located within the tumor that are removed, the T cells most active against the cancer are then isolated or genes in them are modified to increase their efficiency in killing cancer cells. Then what you do is increase these cells by growing them in tissue culture in the laboratory. You make big quantities of these T cells. You kind of clone them over a period of two to eight weeks. And after you get a big batch of anti-cancer T cells ready for action, you reinfuse them into the body, sometimes first reducing the normal T cells that are already in the body that aren't working so well. You infuse these anti-cancer T cells and let them go to work killing the cancer. So this is another approach in addition to immune checkpoint inhibitor. It's being studied in neuroendocrine cancer. And again, we don't know exactly where its role is going to be, but in uh, certain kinds of leukemia and certain other kinds of cancer, the results have been dramatic. And we are certainly hopeful. Another type of immune therapy uses medications called cytokines. Cytokines are naturally occurring proteins the body makes. They're made by normal cells and they regulate the immune response and the immune system's ability to attack cancer. Interferon drugs and interleukin drugs are typically um, used in, as anti-cancer drugs in this category. Interferon alpha is a cytokine used to treat neuroendocrine tumor, can stop tumor growth often for prolonged periods of time. It can cause fatigue, depression, malaise, flu-like symptoms although these symptoms often improve with dose reduction. And in some patients, this can control cancer for years and can also control carcinoid syndrome sometimes for years. So uh, we'll be speaking about these things in more detail as I talk about individual studies. The next type of molecular target I'd like to talk about comes from an extraordinary story where somebody went to one of the rem most remote places on Earth, which is a little tiny island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean called Rapa Nui also known as Easter Island. And on Easter Island are these amazing heads of warriors that are probably 1,000 years old, and they weigh maybe 120 tons, and they're 100 feet high, and they're made of a solid piece of stone and can withstand the biggest uh, hurricanes or whatever might come their way, and are standing in the middle of grass. Nobody knows how they were built, how they got erected, and how they were able to stay there for as long as they have. Uh, it's just a very mysterious thing. So people go there. It's one of the wonders of the world. So some enterprising uh, person decided he would take some of the dirt from the Easter Islands back home and analyze it because maybe there was a microorganism that made an antibiotic that had never been discovered before. People had already analyzed the dirt of Africa and South America and China and America looking for antibiotics like streptomycin coming from streptomyces. Well, sure, sure enough, they found a, a, a microorganism that had never been discovered before, and it made an antibiotic never discovered before. So they didn't know what to do with it, so they called it rapamycin, named after Rapa Nui Island. And this antibiotic had the extraordinary property that it not only killed microorganisms, but it actually killed cancer, and particularly certain kinds of cancer, like neuroendocrine cancer. It's an amazing fortuitous discovery of something naturally there. Rapamycin is also known as serolemus. It's a natural product. And the pharmacologic drug everolemus is a very slight derivative of this naturally occurring antibiotic that has anti-tumor properties. And that has led to all types of treatments for neuroendocrine cancer that have been very good. Rapamycin, by the way, is called an mTOR inhibitor. So what is mTOR? mTOR stands for mammalian target of rapamycin. That's the, how the enzyme in the cell got its name. Now this enzyme regulates cell growth, how long the cells live, 
how much oxygen and nutrient they could assimilate. It's the central regulator of neuroendocrine cells and every cell in the body, it's a central regulator. And it turns out neuroendocrine cells have a lot of mutations that affect the growth with this mechanism. So study was done in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors known as radiant 3. It was one of those important trials I had on the slide earlier on. Everolimus 10 milligrams a day versus placebo in metastatic pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. The largest study of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors ever done in the world with over 400 patients with this rare disease. Okay, progression-free survival was increased from 4.6 months to 11 months with Everolimus. Side effects were usually not severe, but included things like fatigue, mouth sores, diarrhea, rash, respiratory infections, usually easily managed by holding the dose for a week or two until symptoms resolved and then starting the drug again at half dose. And if the dose was adjusted properly, people tended to tolerate it well, often for years. I just saw somebody earlier this week who was on continuous Everolimus for six years with control of a rapidly growing disease resistant to all therapy available before, who was actually on the Radian 3 trial. And then after the Radian 3 trial was closed, he continued on Everolimus until this year. So it's possible to have very long responses, even though the average is close to a year. As we heard with other types of treatments like PRRT, and you'll hear about with somatostatin analogs when people say the average period of control with lanreotide is 33 months, or the average period of control with PRRT is 40 months, that's a statistical average of a population. There are individuals who might go for five or 10 years with no other treatment and have continued control. There's just a big spread, okay? So this is the Radian 3 trial, and as a result of this, it was approved for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. This is what a graph looks like. I don't know if you could see uh, very well on the slide here, but the people that got Everolimus did much, much, much better than the people who didn't. This is another indicator of how people's cancer responded. If you look at the blue, which is what is below the line. Everybody who's blue has responded. This is a graph made of 400 lines, okay? Approximately 191 lines with Everolimus and 189 lines, vertical lines, with placebo. Each one saying what happened from the initial size of the tumor, which is the zero line. So anybody whose tumor got smaller than the zero line, tumor reduced by this amount of percentage. And you can see that even though we say progression-free survival is the goal, like with all the treatments we're talking about today, including PRRT, a high percentage of patients have a reduction in cancer. Now some patients, a few of them, responded to placebo, but this placebo group also was allowed to have octreotide, and it's quite possible that many of those responses were due to the fact they were getting an active drug as well. This is the RADIAN-4 trial, which is a test of Everolimus versus placebo in people with intestinal neuroendocrine tumors or lung neuroendocrine tumors. It's the same idea, except this was a two-to-one randomization. Two people got Everolimus, one person got placebo, and again was positive with the average tumor control being 11.0 months versus 3.9 months with placebo, a major increase in time of progression. And these are, again, are just average figures. They're not talking about individual people. So on the basis of this study that demonstrated a significant progression-free survival benefit in people with longer gastrointestinal tract, 52% reduction in risk of progression, and um, it was FDA approved on this basis for neuroendocrine tumors of lung and GI tract. We're working on drugs that are next generation after Everolimus. It turns out Everolimus attacks a part of the mTOR system known as mTOR1, but there's another part of it called mTOR2 that can lead to resistance, and we have drugs that attack mTOR1 and mTOR2. I did a study with CC223, which is inhibitor of both TORC1 and TORC2, and it looked like we had excellent results. Ad additional trials with this type of drug, uh, several uh, so-called TORC1 and TORC2 inhibitors are being done in neuroendocrine cancer, and just be aware that this is another direction of interest. Now, this is a really ugly picture showing you what blood vessels look like in a tumor. 
Tumors have what we call neovascularity. The tumor induces formation of tiny blood vessels that go all through the tumor, and it takes a lot of blood vessels to keep a tumor going. Otherwise, you get the necrosis that Dr. Tang pointed out, little spots of death of cancer cells where cancer outgrows the blood supply. The tumor's uh, blood vessels are different than normal blood vessels. They're little twisty, turny, um, nasty looking ones that are inside the tumor and they have some different properties than other ones and can be attacked. And if the tumor blood vessels die, the tumor dies because it won't have any nutrition. So another approach to treating neuroendocrine cancer is to starve it by attacking blood vessels. These are, this is what we call anti-angiogenic therapy. There's an antibody called Bevacizumab, brand name of Avastin, which is a monoclonal antibody to vascular endothelial growth factor known as VEGF. It's usually well tolerated, although it can cause increase in blood pressure, blood clots, bleeding, problems with wound healing, protein in the urine. Usually these symptoms are not severe unless uh, it's used inappropriately, but uh, there are rare patients who have bad effects. For most people, it's extremely well tolerated. And a study that was done early on by Dr. Kulke uh, showed a 24% response rate in neuroendocrine tumor. Several other studies were done which were intriguing using uh, this anti-angiogenic bevacizumab with oxaliplatin and 5-FU, another one using um, bevacizumab with oxaliplatin and capecitabine or zolota, and both of these look like they're active in neuroendocrine tumors. So a big randomized trial in carcinoid was done, randomizing people between bevacizumab, the avastin arm, versus interferon, the cytokine I talked about earlier, to see what the story was when you either use one or the other, both groups getting octreotide. The conclusion was progression-free survival was the same in both groups. So that doesn't tell you um, which is better in terms of progression-free survival. They're both equally good. Interferon alpha is active and bevacizumab is active. However, bevacizumab had a much higher response rate. The problem is that uh, because bevacizumab combination had more toxicity and progression-free survival is not improved, there's no recommendation at this point to use it routinely, but just stay tuned. There's reason to believe there's a synergy there. The same type of thing happened in a recently completed study of everolemus in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors versus everolemus plus bevacizumab. And what happened there is the same thing. The overall response rate on CAT scans and MRIs, much greater reduction in tumor size when you use a combination, 12% with everolemus versus major response of 31% with a combination, progression-free survival not much improved and still not recommended for standard use, but it's something of interest. Another um, similar study was done with tempsorolemus, which is a drug similar to everolemus, except it's intravenous, in combination with bevacizumab, the same anti-angiogenic. Anti and again, we see the same type of response. Is, uh, is this messed up a little bit? Okay, we, we, see, we see the same type of response as we saw before where you have a major improvement in tumor size when you use the two together. This is not... Uh... Okay, sunitinib is a drug of a class called the tyrosine kinase inhibitor, one that we talked about earlier, it attacks a molecular target on the surface of neuroendocrine cells. And one of its prominent properties, although it does a lot of different things, is to be an anti-angiogenic affecting the VEGF receptor. So this treatment in pancreatic neuroendocrine cancer that had previously progressed was used and patients were randomized to sunitinib or placebo. The results are almost identical to that seen with everolemus that the average time to progression was 11.1 .1 months with sunitinib and 5.5 .5 months with placebo. 
The side effects were generally tolerated if the dose was adjusted properly, but certainly can make people feel horrible if you're taking too much or somebody who is exceptionally sensitive to the drug. Interestingly, Everolimus and Sunitinib were written up in the same journal of New England Journal of Medicine and approved by the FDA on the same day in 2011, and all of a sudden we had two new drugs for treating pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. Okay. One of the questions is, what do you use when? And that remains a question. We have to look at the toxicity profile and see if one is better than another for particular patients. Sometimes it's uh, just a question of, um, there is no one right answer, but you use one, and if it progresses, you use another. One of the things you have to remember about treating neuroendocrine cancer is it's not just a one-time treatment. It's something which is an ongoing process. And we have to say, when is the best time to use PRRT? When is the best time to use somatostatin analogs? When is it the best time to use targeted treatments? When is it the best time to use one thing or And again, it takes a really concerted effort with the multidisciplinary tumor board. It takes a lot of experience and um, individualization to come up with the best treatment at the best time. I'm trying to kind of go through a lot of data and then maybe um, later on in my talk or in the question period, we can talk about how we might make some of these decisions. Another anti-angiogenic, pizopinib, is quite active in carcinoid tumors, and based on that, a randomized trial was done, just finished accrual, and we're waiting for answers in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Now, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors are unique among the well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors that they can respond well to chemotherapy. The uh, drug streptozosin, we don't use so much today, but it still is active. And streptozosin, doxorubicin, and 5-FU had a 39% major response rate, which is remarkable, although the responses only lasted 9.3 months on the average. But sometimes this is enough to make an inoperable tumor of the pancreas, for example, become operable so it could be taken out and it might have been so big that surgery wasn't possible before. So even though it's not a real long response, it sometimes is a valuable response. Nowadays, rather than using streptozosin, we tend to use temozolomide and capecitabine, which is amazingly, it's amazing because it's based on only a very, very limited experience, but it's such a striking experience, it's changed practice patterns throughout the world. A paper published by Dr. Strasberg, 71% partial response rate, 29% stable disease for at least a year with an oral chemotherapy that's generally very well tolerated. So rather than using streptozosin, which has more potential for gastrointestinal and kidney toxicity, we tend to use temozolomide capecitabine, although we really do await data from the clinical trial, which is uh, not reported yet, but hopefully we'll have answers soon, of temozolomide versus temozolomide plus capecitabine to see uh, how much the capecitabine adds. Is it synergistic or does it really add only toxicity? We don't know which is better, but I think this is a very important trial, and I'm hoping in the next year or so we will have answers to this question. Another unknown question is whether you should use biologic drugs like Everolimus first, or you should use chemotherapy first. A study being done in Europe is randomizing people between Everolimus versus streptozosin 5-FU, and then at time of progression, switching and seeing which sequence is better. They're calling this a SEQTOR trial, looking at the sequence. These are some of the other drugs, certainly not a complete list of drugs that are currently in clinical trial right now in neuroendocrine tumors of targeted biologic agents trying to figure out the place of all of these things in management and see which may improve what we have right now. Another important thing to be aware of is the anti-serotonin drug, which was mentioned earlier today, known as telotrostat etoprate. This is going to be an absolutely practice-changing medicine when hopefully the FDA will approve it by the end of November. That's going to be reviewed at that time. And since it's so effective and side effects are so low, we're feeling very hopeful that approval will actually happen. What you see here in this X is the inhibition of an enzyme called tryptophan hydroxylase. This enzyme is necessary to make serotonin. Remember, tryptophan, the essential amino acid that you eat, is the precursor that makes all the serotonin in the body. You have tryptophan, you get 5-hydroxytryptophan, hydro 
then you get 5-hydroxytryptamine, which is a synonym for serotonin, the cause of the carcinoid syndrome. You block this enzyme, you stop the serotonin from getting produced, and you'll dramatically reduce diarrhea, flushing can improve, and carcinoid syndrome can tremendously improve. So this uh, it has been subjected to a rigorous phase three trial of placebo versus two doses of telotristat, then everybody getting telotristat, the 5-HIA level in the blood fell tremendously, approximately 50% reduction or more than 50% reduction. It was actually 57.7% uh, reduction in 5-HIAA secretion when people took telotristat, again, with very, very low side effects. And along with that, the diarrhea got remarkably better. So based on this, I'm expecting we're going to see an approval. And this can be used in conjunction with the octreotide. So you don't have to stop the octreotide. This is not a substitute for octreotide. It doesn't have the, or lanreotide. It doesn't have the anti-cancer properties. Lanreotide, we know, will control cancer for an average of 33 months. It stops it from growing. It's an anti-cancer drug. This is an anti-carcinoid syndrome drug which can be used to help the control of carcinoid syndrome that we get with the somatostatin analog. I want to remind you of a ancient Indian proverb that tells us so much about how to treat neuroendocrine cancer. The, you might have heard the story about the 10 blind wise men, great philosophers in ancient India, who never saw an elephant before, and they decided they would all examine the elephant, and then they would discuss what an elephant was, and they would figure out the nature of an elephant. So the fellow who was playing with a trunk thought it was a hose, and the person that had the tail thought it was a rope, and the people who had a leg thought it was a tree trunk, and all these different interpretations, but nobody can figure out what the elephant was until these fellows were able to sit down at a table and talk to each other, each one putting in his contribution. So today, instead of having the elephant in the middle of the room, we have a zebra in the middle of the room, a carcinoid patient. And the 10 blind men become 10 oncologists, endocrinologists, radiation oncologists, all kinds of medical specialists, each one an expert in their specialty, but somewhat blind to the other specialties. You put everybody together, and everybody puts in their input and really good treatment decisions could be made for a disease which is so rare that using only objective, evidence-based decision-making from large trials are not enough to follow a little cookbook and say what should be done for every patient. It really takes a serious discussion. I just want to leave you um, my last slide. I know we're a little pressed for time today. A few questions to think about. We can talk more during the question session, if you like. How should the sequence of systemic therapies in neuroendocrine tumor management be optimized? When should people have surgery? When should people have embolization of the liver? When should you have PRRT? When should you have a somatostatin analog and so on? How should local and regional therapy be integrated with the uh, systemic therapy? Which one comes first? Which one comes second? And why? When should somatostatin analogs like octreotide or lanreotide be started? And how should they be integrated with chemotherapy, biologic therapy, and PRRT? And how long should they be continued after uh, disease progresses on those drugs? Should they be continued anyway? How should advances in molecular biology and gen genomic profiling inform treatment decisions at the present time? And how should PRRT be integrated with chemotherapy, with immune therapy, and biologic therapy? We're currently starting a trial of immune checkpoint inhibitors with PRRT. So PRRT makes extra mutations from the radiation in tumor cells, and theoretically those cells will then be much more susceptible to an immune attack because there are so many new antigens uh, from the mutations that happen in the tumor cells. So we're trying to improve upon that to have the best from PRRT and immune therapy at the same time. And just many, many trials like that need to be developed, but how to optimize the sequence and combination of these various treatments we've been talking about remains to be d discussed. So that's the end of my prepared remarks, and I just want to thank you for letting me speak with you today.